Welcome to Royal Haunts and part one of the House of Hanover. After 111 years of Stuart rule came the House of Hanover. We have to look back to the Stuarts to see how this succession came about. Elizabeth, the eldest daughter of James I of England, married Frederick V, who was Elector of Palatine, this being a principality. Having several children, there was a daughter, Sophia, who married Ernst Augustus, who held the Principality of Hanover. Though Sophia was thirty years older than Queen Anne, she was the closest Protestant relative. Sophia never had the chance of becoming Queen, dying on the 8th of June in 1714, with Anne following on the 1st of August. The mantle then passed to Sophia's eldest son, George, and that is who took the throne of what had become Great Britain. The English language had been set by Henry the Seventh, and so when George became king, he was the first in a long while not to speak the language of his subjects. And as James I moved his court from Scotland to England, George I did likewise. By this time he was fifty-four years old, having been married and divorced with a son thirty years of age and a daughter who had been married off to Frederick Wilhelm I of Prussia. On his father's death in 1698, George became Elector of Hanover, while gaining domains from his three uncles, who had not provided any male heirs, and so this was where his main interest remained. Taking little interest in own policies, Parliament virtually ruled itself, taking more power from the Crown. During his reign of almost thirteen years, there was two Jacobite rebellions, the first being just after his accession in 1715. Though the House of Hanover was officially invited to take the accession, Scottish Parliament had not been consulted, being expected to accept the rulings of London. Queen Anne had also remained in contact with her father throughout his exile, having a good relationship with her half-sister Louise, who was born three years after William and Mary usurped the throne. Anne would have preferred the Stuart dynasty to continue, but it was difficult even for those politicians with Jacobite leanings to accept James Charles Edward Stuart, known as the Old Pretender, without him recanting his Catholic faith. With no children, her son William having died from a fever in 1700, Anne yielded Parliament's decision to invite Sophia, the Electress of Hanover, to be next in line to the succession, even though she was 70 years of age. The strongest Jacobite support was in Scotland, and with promises of arms, money and French soldiers, the Stuart standard was raised at Braemar, twelve days before George arrived from Hanover. High on the hopes of French support, the Scots took up the Stuart cause, with Northerners following their lead. But most English Jacobites waited for the arrival of James Stuart and the promised soldiers. But James didn't arrive until December, in which time the Jacobite armies had been kept separate and defeated both at Stirling and Preston. With the British fleet on alert, there was no soldiers and no weapons. In fact, to reach British soil, James had arrived disguised as a seaman, and delayed by storms, was weakened by seasickness, while his treasure lay on the seabed after the ship carrying it was wrecked. Though not all was lost, the armies had not fallen completely, and all that was needed was for James to inspire the troops and encourage those who wavered to his side. Unfortunately, James was so ill by the voyage that he could do little, and soon found himself having to run away, to live, to fight another day. And that day came, in 1719, when the Scots rose again, though in a half-hearted way at the side of four years previous. By this time France had been forced to exile James in a treaty with Great Britain, and so he found aid from Spain. Again the weather was against them, but a handful of Spanish soldiers got through, making a garrison at Eileen Donan Castle. Set on the shores of Loch Duich, naval ships were sent to take the castle, blasting it with cannon fire until the munition room took a hit. A Spanish soldier is said to haunt the castle, though it's not known if he was killed there or at the Battle of Glensheel. Either way, he appears a headless figure. George I was quite a scandal as far as his British subjects were concerned. Though kings had had mistresses in abundance, under Queen Anne things had changed. 
Not only did George openly flaunt his mistresses as he was divorced, and so free to see whom he pleased, but it was the way he treated his wife. Sophia Dorothea was the daughter of George William of Sal, uncle of George I, and so making them first cousins. George's mother had already interfered in two marriage negotiations, which could have been very prosperous for Sophia. Instead, the two sets of parents decided she should marry George, who was already heir to her father's kingdom, as no female could inherit a principality. Sophia was badly treated and physically abused by George, but for the most part ignored. It wasn't until a friendship blossomed between her and a dashing young count, Philip Christoph von Konigsmark, that rumours began to spread of an affair. Konigsmark was sent away, but eventually returned with a plan to whisk Sophia away from her brutal husband. The Count subsequently disappeared, with most historians believing that George was involved in the murder of Konigsmark. He then set about divorcing Sophia, but couldn't very well use the charge of adultery, as he was just as guilty. Instead, the divorce was set on the grounds of Sophia abandoning her husband. But then there was another matter, as George received a yearly sum of money through his wife, Not wishing to lose this, and with the agreement of her father, Sophia was held at Alden Castle in Sel, where she wasn't allowed to see her family, nor her two children, who she never saw again. And there she remained at the castle for thirty years up to her death. Having been taken ill, she knew she lay on her deathbed as she wrote a final letter to George with a promise that the letter would be placed directly in his hand. It was another six months before George paid his country of birth another visit. Travelling by coach to Osnabrück, an envoy came with Sophia's letter, handing it to George, who, thinking it was an important dispatch, ripped it open, only to read Sophia's words cursing him for what he had done to her, believing she had been poisoned on his orders. The entourage moved on, but Sophia's words must have had a great effect, as he had not travelled far when he suffered a stroke, dying several days later. With the death of George I, there was little mourning on the part of his son, who became George the Second and Elector of Hanover. George married Caroline of Ansbach in 1705, nine years before his father was to become King of Great Britain. Being invested Prince of Wales, he moved his family of three daughters to London, leaving his eldest, seven-year-old Frederick, in Hanover, where he took part in state occasions. From the outset, George was a thorn in his father's side, encouraging opposition against the king's policies. On the part of George I, his son came from Sophia Dorothea, where there was an intense dislike nurtured by his mother, And as for George the Second, having his mother taken from him when he was eleven years old, never being allowed to see her again, stemmed a hatred for his father that the two argued to the point that George and Caroline was exiled from court. It's highly likely that had George the First lived, he would have pressured Parliament to bypass his son's succession in favour of his grandson, Frederick. George the Second must also have felt that Frederick was being groomed by his father, and because he had received the favouritism of George the First, when Frederick was called to England, he found his estranged family hostile towards him. This led to Frederick holding a court of opposition against the king's policies. Living the standards of a prince, the allowance was not enough that he soon accumulated debts that Parliament had to intervene and increase his allowance. Frederick was twenty-nine years old when he married. His wife, Princess Augusta, was sixteen years old and spoke no English, but the marriage was a successful one, producing nine children. Had Frederick lived, he may have found himself cast further afield, as there was thoughts of sending the Prince and Princess of Wales to the colonies, while setting out the motion to bypass him in the succession in favour of his younger brother, William, Duke of Cumberland. However, Frederick died at the age of 44, leaving a five-month pregnant widow. The cause of death was said to be a burst abscess on one of the lungs, while others put it down to being struck by a cricket ball, one of the prince's favourite games of sport. 
There were also those who considered Frederick's death to be very convenient, leading to whispers that the prince had been done away with. The succession was then placed upon the eldest son, George, who was no more than a thirteen-year-old boy. During the reign of George the Second, with most of Europe at war, Britain declared war upon Spain. In turn, this set an advantage for yet another Jacobite rebellion. They were once again aided by France, who yet again promised to send troops to fight with the Jacobite rebels. The year was 1745, 27 years since the last rebellion, with a whole new generation of young Scots ready to fight for a return to the House of Stuart. It also meant that James was 27 years older, and no doubt remembering the voyage that had caused him to have to be carried to shore, this time it was his son that carried the banner on behalf of his father. Charles Stuart was the biggest threat that came close to toppling the Hanover throne, and had his ambitions been to take just Scotland, they may well have been fulfilled. With a fleet of ships, Prince Charles set sail, only to have to retreat through bad storms. The second attempt was only successful in that Charles reached shore with a handful of friends. There was still support for the Jacobite cause among the Scottish clans, but Charles didn't receive the welcome he expected. All went well for Charles as he rose his father's standard at Glenfinnan, and there appeared to be no stopping him as taking Edinburgh his force grew. Defeating the parliamentary army at the Battle of Prestonpans, the army of 6,000 continued on to Carlisle until they finally reached Derby. By this time the welcome was more hostile, with provisions being withheld from the troops, while bridges and roads were blocked to heed their progress. With no sign of French troops coming to their aid, the generals argued for a return to Scotland. Charles was bitterly disappointed, but with no other option, headed north, with the hungry, demoralised army knowing the English, headed by George the Second's son William, was hot on their heels. It was at Culloden where the weary Scottish soldiers met their fate. The Duke of Cumberland and his men showed no mercy, killing those that lay wounded, leaving over 1,000 dead. Charles escaped, leaving within minutes at the start of battle. It's said that Culloden, the field that was drenched with so much Scottish blood, reenacts what took place on that terrible day of the 16th of April, 1746, the anniversary being the most prestigious date for any paranormal activity. Before the uprising, Charles was installed at Westbrook Place at Godalming. This is where plans for the rebellion were set out, with Charles only being able to exercise at night or in the early hours of the morning for fear of being seen. And that is where the ghost of Bonnie Prince Charlie is said to return, with reported sightings of a brown cloaked figure walking the pathways, either at twilight or the early hours of the morning. Another haunt said to be that of Bonnie Prince Charlie is the Salutation Hotel at Perth. During the campaign, Charles used the hotel for his headquarters, which now claims the ghost of the prince haunts the bedroom he used. After months of being on the run, Charles returned to exile, where he fell into a life of drunken debauchery. His father, being recognised as king by the Pope, didn't give Charles or his brother Henry the same honour. Suffering a massive heart attack, George II died at the residential home of Kensington Palace, where he is now said to haunt. Tales go that George can be seen on the odd occasion looking out of a window to the weather vane, as he often did in life. Though he was King of Great Britain, his main interest lay in Hanover, and he would often look to the vane to see which way the wind was blowing, as ships could be delayed if the weather was against them. His death meant a new king for Great Britain, with succession going to his 22-year-old grandson, who for the next 60 years reigned as George the Third.